much, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Optimize It webinar. My name is Joanna Balkowski, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Angos, and I will be your moderator for today. So for those just joining us right now, I'd like to cover off a few housekeeping items. There is no dial-in number, and the audio for this webcast is through your computer speakers. Also, today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available for replay post-event. Um, during the webinar, you can use the Q&A box, and I'm just going to show you that right here, um, to ask any questions during this event. Um, if we do not get through all the questions today, I will compile them and provide you with answers within the next couple of days. So today with me, um, I have Chris Long, our Solution Specialist Lead with more than 16 years of experience in analytics and optimization, and Michael Vallely, our Senior Data Scientist and Expert in Predictive Analytics. Both Michael and Chris will take you on an optimization journey as we, uh, as we definitely demonstrate to you why optimization is no longer good to have, but rather a must have. I'd like to start off with a quick overview of Angos for those who may not be familiar with us. Um, we have been working in the business analytics space for more than 20 years. We provide a software suite for products um, from end-to-end -end data mining processes and development and deployment of advanced predictive models. We also provide professional services for clients who want help with predictive and prescriptive analytics, as well as managed services for clients who want to use and execute analytic solutions um, and use us on their behalf, but don't necessarily want to invest in the specialized skills or tools required to implement those solutions. So while there are many functional applications for predictive and prescriptive analytics in general, um, and for our toolkit in particular, we focus primarily in the areas of risk management, marketing, and sales. And finally, our mission is to make analytics easier to use and more accessible to a broader audience from the advanced statistician through to the business users. So we really hope today that you will have a better sense of how we can help customers achieve that mission after today's discussion. In today's webcast, I will set the foundation for prescriptive analytics and let Chris take you on the optimization journey from defining optimization to being able to see its value uh, through optimization approaches and business use cases, which Chris will cover in risk, retail, and marketing. Michael will then provide you with a demonstration of a marketing optimization use case using our optimization software, Insight Optimizer. Afterwards, I will recap today's discussion with key market trends on optimization, and we will proceed to Q&A. So once again, thank you again for your attendance and participation today, and let's get started. So in today's fast-paced market, we're seeing that companies are looking into analytics tools that really automate their current decision-making process to help them stay competitive. Um, they are looking for solutions that would transition current decisioning methods from reactive to proactive to actionable. Historically, uh, historically, companies have mainly focused on two business analytic methods, and that's descriptive and predictive analytics. Um, descriptive analytics enables companies to perform post-mortem analysis to investigate reasons why certain outcomes have occurred, whereas predictive analytics, on the other hand, enables companies to forecast what might happen in the future through models that represent patterns and trends, the most influential variables, and the relationship between them. Over time, of course, a third business analyst um, analytics discipline was introduced, and that is prescriptive analytics. And this provides companies with the ability to completely operationalize their models. Um, prescriptive analytics also complements descriptive and predictive analytics by providing a preferred course of action for almost any predictive model and answers that question, what should I do? So without further ado, I will pass it to um, to Chris here to take you on an in-depth um, analysis of optimization. Thank you, Joanna. So let's first talk a little bit about what is optimization. Uh, it's a convoluted term, but there is some formal definitions. Gartner defines it as, it is the type of prescriptive analytics that finds the best solution from a set of feasible solutions using a mathematical algorithm that maximizes or minimizes a specified objective function subject to constraints. So what does this mean? How does this provide value for your business? Well, really, uh, when we're defining best, it needs to be an objective. So what, when you achieve that objective, you're achieving something that is best. So your first challenge when thinking about optimization will be how is best defined in your business? And then you need to look at feasible. 
What does this mean? It's really an audit of your constraints, real-world constraints, things that you may, can't, you may not be able to change that exist in the real world, uh, but also constraints that you're setting as part of the operating parameters of your business. So if we take a look again at the um, analytics maturity, what's present today out there in the analytics world, um, let's have another look at hindsight, insight, and foresight. Uh, really hindsight or telling you what has happened in your business or what's available to your business today is reporting. Um, but there's a lot of advancements today in reporting that make things visual. There's a lot of exciting new visual tools out there on the market that allow you to make dashboards that are drillable, um, uh, things that are uh, you know, making queries visible, uh, basically making reporting available to anyone, to the business user. Um, and that trend has actually continued into the pr predictive analytics space. You know, once in the realm of PhDs, people that uh, had to uh, really know what they were doing, had to program in, in sophisticated programming languages uh, to get statistics and predictive, uh, right predictive models. Um, and then, you know, what to do with all of that. So we're really moving into the realm of we've got predictions of the future, we've got um, forecasting. How do we apply that? How do we make that real? How do we execute on it? Um, and this is what I think of as optimization. Uh, and it gives you a powerful tool, a powerful way of automating decisions in your business. So let's explore that a little bit. When we talk about value and optimization, one of the things that uh, we see coming up again and again and an analysts out there report on is uh, the analytics maturity sort of fits this value curve. Uh, reporting tends to be a cost-related activity, uh, but there's an inflection point where you transition from discovering what has happened to your business, getting diagnostic, di excuse me, diagnostic about it, and trying to figure out why things happened. Um, but then even more valuable is going into the realm of what should I do and what will happen when I do it. Um, we see this curve over and over again, and it leads us to, to really believe that optimization can add almost any business a lot of value. So predictive analytics uh, can be described as really four areas of discipline. Uh, there's the data management, and we know today that uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on in data management, sometimes called big data, which is you know, loosely defined as data that may be uh, slowly going outside the reach of capacity of your business. People talk about in terms of volume of data, velocity of the change of data, the variety of data that comes in from structured to unstructured, as well as the veracity of data, which is really just the quality of the data. Um, and then, you know, practices around analytics and business roles. And there's tools today that actually allow business users to sit down, define rules, uh, logic that they know that they can lean on in their business that they know is true, but also analytics, things that are less certain, uh, trying to figure out and forecast based on uncertainty. Uh, there's a lot of value in that, but where the struggle happens is trying to take those insights and make them real, putting them into an execution, a business execution, if you will. And then, of course, reporting. And so we want to measure. We want to take those execution steps and we want to measure, do we get the results that we expected? Um, are we achieving our goals? Loosely defined, you can think of predictive analytics like this, these four areas of discipline. Where optimization comes into play is inserting in the middle of this. Optimization solves a decisioning problem where you've taken all of those expensive products that you've put together in your business for data, um, all of the investments that you've made in producing predictive analytical models and scores and uh, customer lifetime value scores, risk scores, et cetera, um, and allows you to organize them in such a way that an optimization pro process will actually prescribe how to act and actually take care of a large portion of the decisioning that your business needs to do. Um, and you can measure this. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about that. But before we do, I wanted to talk a little bit about business challenges. And you might be wondering this if you're new to optimization. Um, you probably might be asking yourself the question, how do I get started? Um, my advice to you is start small. Pick a site or a silo within your organization. Define an objective that seems to make sense from a high level. Um, and examine your constraints. Put your constraints together. Look at what's needed 
and see if it's there in the analytics and work backwards. Is the data supporting uh, your analytics there as well? Um, start small, get value, grow quickly. Traditional business intelligence and analytics tools may not offer this support, and so you may have to grow the tool set that your team is using, you or your team may already be using. Uh, traditional software dabbles in optimization, but true mathematical optimization is somewhat new. It's computationally intensive, and choosing the right tool is an important step. You may not be sure where to apply optimization in terms of your business, and so like I showed you a high-level flow, but one of the best ways to think about it is optimization is this final judicious process that happens at the moment of execution and decides across your entire action and customer data set what is the best um, course of action possible. If you think you're going to have challenges defining objectives, really an objective is just something quantifiable, something measurable that you want to maximize or minimize, and again, start small. Uh, an objective is not something that you need to execute on right away. You can maximize an objective, see the results, uh, adjust it, test, improve. And then finally, and this is, comes from my own experience, when you start rolling out prescriptive analytics, you'll start to see uh, a directive to do things to base your business on that may be in conflict with existing belief. This is, this is common. Um, Prescriptive analytics and optimization offer a fact-based decisioning process which may be more real uh, and currently point out mistakes that you might be making in your business. So get ready for those challenges, and there are ways we'll, we'll explore today to overcome them. So one of the things I wanted to prepare for you is what I call a visual challenge demonstration. And it's just a walkthrough of a, a pretty fairly simple example to sort of give you an idea of what optimization does and how it may provide value over and above other methods. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd like to sort of get clear is when you're optimizing for any business, you're generally approaching it from, okay, I've got a list of customers or prospects or uh, et cetera, and I want to align those with actions, business actions. And so depending on the nature of your business, this could be you know, a variety of things. But actions generally have two things associated with them, a cost to perform that action, but also an expected return based on the business that that action provides. Uh, further complicating this picture is the way you communicate these actions to your customers, often referred to as channels. Today, more than ever, there is a plethora of channels out there, and deciding on which channel to use to interact with your customer may not be obvious, less obvious today than it was in previous years. Further confounding the problem is constraints. And so constraints are really um, two camps, so stuff about the real world that you can't change and maybe stuff that's part of your planning that you can change or things that maybe through extra cost you can alter. Uh, but when you're putting together an optimization problem and you want to maximize or minimize an objective, for today I'm going to walk through an example of maximizing revenue, um, you're going to want to be cognizant of the constraints that you're going to run into. So one of the first things that optimization gives you, a good, correct math-based optimization will give you an exact uh, relationship over, across your entire customer base between a customer and a business action. Um, what this does is it gives you a granular approach to managing your business. Oftentimes in, for example, marketing, they'll break customers down into segments, which are valuable, um, even micro-segments. Um, this, this simplifies the problems of, of optimization because now you're just trying to figure out uh, optimization by segment. You're trying to figure out what is the best course of action for segments of customers, radically simplifying the problem computationally. But a good optimization approach will actually break this down to the lowest level possible, which is customers. And so ultimately what you're going to get out at the very minimum to maximize or minimize your objective is going to be a customer ID business action match. Um, in this simple example, you'll see Lyft, and it's not uncommon even using other methods of getting granular to see Lyft over segmentation. Um, so I just thought I'd want to point that out, but then purely uh, approaching optimization, 
there are, there are basic methods out there that I've seen that fall into the camp of rules-based. So let me set the stage with an example. Um, you've got model scores that define response probability for each one of your channels. And in this example, we have three channels. For each customer, we have a model which actually predicts the propensity to respond favorably on one of those channels to a business action. Let's call that expected value. So the propensity of them to respond on the channel multiplied by the expected revenue on that channel. We'll ignore costs for the purposes of this example. But our objective is to maximize expected value. So how would we approach this? Well, wait, there's still some constraints we need to consider. Each customer must get a minimum one offer, but one offer only. And each channel only has the capacity to handle three customers. So once again, nine customers in our customer universe, three channels. So we can approach this uh, in two basic ways with rules. We can say, okay, let's prioritize the actions because we know which actions are the most profitable, right? So let's say a channel is one of our actions. Reaching out to the customer on the channel is action, and we know some analytics around that. Our top customer selection for each action is based on their expected value. So again, expected value is going to drive this, but we're going to prioritize by our channels. So for our first channel, we know it can handle three um, touches with our customers. So we're going to pick, let's start with the email. It's pretty straightforward. We pick the top three numbers in there. Very easy. Um, then let's consider our next channel, next in priority. It's email. We're going to touch our next three largest customers. But wait, we can't, right? We've already run into a constraint. So this is sometimes referred to as an opportunity cost. Um, we didn't take advantage of uh, a, a more profitable customer action relationship. Uh, this gets more protracted as we continue down the line, and now we have our third action. We're leaving even more money on the table. So... Um, what can we do? Is this a good approach? Maybe it's as good as uh, it can get. Maybe it's the best we can do with our current tools. Um, but keep in mind, our expected return here is $655. let us say it's $655. Um, we can approach this differently in a more granular approach and take it from the customer perspective. So same example, same constraints, but now I'm going to prioritize based on customers. I'm going to pick my most valuable customer, based on the available actions available. So I pick the top one. I can continue down much the same way we did previously, except now I'm considering each customer. It's really just a computational way of going through a set of rules. We end up, again, leaving some money on the table, but we have an improvement. So how could we do even better than this? Well, the answer, as you probably guessed, is to use a mathematical approach. Mathematical optimization allows us to cover this set holistically, and we can actually solve it at once. <clears throat> so there is um, an improvement of 30 in this example, but keep in mind this is a very small example. Uh, this is the kind of improvement that you could expect to see by applying this op optimization approach in much larger examples in the real world. <clears throat> If we compare the three um, examples that I went through, you can see a clear trend. We get more granular and we actually increase the amount of revenue, the expected amount of revenue, but it's the mathematical optimization that is the winner. There's also some subtle approaches that I want you to consider is that if you're not using a rules-based approach, then you're not having to deal with sets of heuristics and rules. So the manual time-consuming process that you may be doing or having to do there goes away. Um, optimization approaches, we, we set one uh, clear objective in this and it's expected revenue, but we can quickly change that and rerun this. There is no need to go back and change any rules. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm going to get into a little more detail is that ability to change things about your optimization, whether it's your objective or your constraints, and see the difference, impact, the difference in impact it would have on your business. Um, as we mentioned, this relies on facts, so you're basically running your business based on what's known, what's factual, uh, truth, and it solves across the entire data set holistically. So an important point, we're not considering each customer individually, we're actually considering each customer based on what all other customers will be treated as as well. So it's a Im very important point, keeping in mind the holistic uh, objective. So let's get into a little bit of getting started with optimization. <clears throat> uh, 
ultimately you're going to have to collect some data that feeds into the optimization process. The first thing we're, you're going to want to do is define a goal. And so this is what we mean when we say objective. So your business goal, uh, in my experience, is never something as simple as maximizing profit. Although that makes a lot of sense, you, it tends, optimization tends to provide value in optimize, optimizing any objective. And so you may have more sophisticated objectives, like, for example, maximizing profit but balancing another objective. Like in the risk world, you may want to balance your appetite for risk. In the marketing world, you may want to balance your costs for the campaigns, etc. Um, you also want to do an audit of your constraints and the business rules, so rules that are, you're using to drive your business. This could be something as simple as setting a budget overall, setting a budget for particular channels, etc. Um, and then actions. So the actions will be the second largest table of data that you're going to feed into this process. Uh, this is you sitting down as an analyst and defining the business actions, what they cost to perform, any analytics that they may rely on to calculate those costs, uh, but also any expected revenue that comes from extending those business actions. And then finally, customer data. So you can think of this as the largest set of data that's going to be fed into the optimization problem. Typically, you know, uh, businesses of a large size will have millions of customers, as you can imagine. Um, so not just millions of rows in your customer data table, but also attributes in that table linking them to demographic and behavioral information. So you know, not just where they live, uh, but any regulatory information, any information that maybe makes them ineligible for receiving a business action. Um, and also, and most importantly, any analytical products that define how uh, a score which dictates their propensity to be interested in a particular business action. So you can, uh, the optimization process can align things accordingly. And so what you do with all this information is feed it into an optimization process. And so this is the, you know, the computational algorithm that goes through, it crunches the numbers for you, uh, and gives you a, an output. And so I don't want you to think of this yet as something, an actionable output. This is, we're solving, we're maximizing your optimization, we're maximizing an objective. Let's say we'll continue with our example and say that your objective is maximizing revenue. Um, you'll get a report. It'll tell you your total expected revenue. It'll tell you the costs balanced over your expected revenue will give you a, a, an ROI measure. Uh, there's, there's really no limit to how we can exam, uh, examine this. We can look at you know, costs overall. We can look at you know, the amount of time it takes uh, to extend. Um, so there's a number of things that we're going to want to do and report off of, but ultimately when we're done, we can say, okay, this is our baseline. And so when you're first approaching optimization or an optimization problem in an organization, you're going to want to do exactly that. Set a baseline. I sometimes refer to it as business as usual. So it's an accurate representation to how your business is run, as accurate as you can make it. Um, and then what you can do is consider what I call what-if scenarios, and so do this what-if analysis. So this is a key part of prescriptive analytics where you've got uh, different ways that you can manage your business. You can ask yourself questions, well, what if I was to decrease the budget? What would happen then? What if I was to increase it? And record the output. Ultimately, you would end up with a set of these what-if experiments um, that you can choose from, and it really comes down to that where you have an experiment that you want to make a choice from. You sit down and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm doing some budgetary planning. Uh, maybe I can justify an increase in budget. What would that happen? What, what kind of effect would that have overall on my business? What would the expected revenues be? Um, and so you can look at the relative change in terms of increasing budget and expected return. This is the same thing with capacities. You can look at, well, what if I was to lower the capacity on one of my more expensive channels, saving money? What kind of effect would that have? Um, I forgot about a competing interest. In some businesses, interests like in risk, um, competing interests like appetite for risk and profit are obvious. But in other businesses like marketing, you may actually have different marketing departments all competing for a customer's wallet share. And so you need to balance what's in the best interest for the business overall. You have competing objectives. Um, and then finally, contact policy, which is really worth pointing out. Uh, this is usually a policy set at an enterprise level where you don't want to over-inundate your customers with contacts. You want to keep communication limited with them. 
Um, and so you might want to see what is the effect of that. If I said, okay, we can cost, contact customers once a month, what if we were to change it to once every two months? What kind of effect would that have? And look at the results. So I'm just going to give you one example. I mean, what we're talking about when we change these levers and these dials and knobs, changing constraints, what we're really talking about is uh, limits that we're setting. And so when we change these limits and rerun optimization, we can actually plot. And so what I'm showing you is an example of uh, from a campaign that's run. And the campaign profit is what we're maximizing, just like the example we went through. And so uh, we want to maximize, our objective is to maximize that, but we're constraining it. And so when we run our optimization, it's going to say this is the maximum expected value that you could get in terms of profit with the constraints that you have set. And as we go through and change those constraints, let's say budget, which is represented on the x-axis, we're going to measure our costs. And oftentimes you will see this curve. These curves are valuable. Curves are eyebrow raising and they're interesting. And when, we want to, when we want to improve our business, we can see stuff like this happen all the time with constraints. And so we're scrutinizing the constraint of budget, which is telling us that if we actually rolled back our budget, we would have only have a slight loss in overall profit, um, which generates 56% or 56% lift in our expected return. It's a powerful reporting tool. And remember, we actually haven't talked anything about executing on this yet. Ultimately, when you have a scenario that, that seems to be in line, something you want to execute on, maybe something that you need to report off of, take it to your stakeholders and get buy-in, you can execute at any time. The really great thing about optimization, as we touched on earlier, is at the minimum it's producing a customer action match. So you can think of this as actually a spreadsheet which lists all your customers, what you should do with them at the absolute minimum. And of course, we can actually add to that by saying, you know, not just what to do, what channel, when to do it. And we're going to finish today with a demo on actually how to choose the best channel. So I wanted to talk a little bit about business use cases. Um, I know there's people from all different businesses on the line. Um, and so we chose three business examples to walk you through um, how optimization would play just from a high level and how it might help these businesses. So in risk management, risk management really deals with a customer journey from the point of uh, originations, so the onboarding process, where optimization can actually help by aligning and balancing risk and reward on an initial uh, product offering to a customer. Um, but then also balance a customer's need to have any credit line increase or any change in that product offering. Um, we can also look at strategies sometimes referred to as retention in that world, where we still want to balance risk into that picture, but proactively look for opportunities to actually change our relationship with that customer to make it more profitable. For example, if they uh, have, a, have had a great relationship with us and a new uh, models have recalculated their risk score as being less risky. And then finally, dealing with ultimately what may happen um, collections, and so the, po the segment of your population that does go into default. Um, so really the first couple of things and where there's a lot of value in managing risk and using optimization to manage risk, uh, just to sum up, is balancing risk and value. And, you know, it's a, it's a very simple statement, but it can be very complex to uh, deploy. You need to have models that predict risk. You need to have models that calculate customer lifetime value, loyalty, uh, alerts based on these things. Um, but ultimately, optimization can actually help you get a large lift over what you may already be doing today. For collections, uh, there's actually more that optimization can provide. I mean, this is a cost center, and so one of the things that we can do is actually limit those costs overall, collect that overdue money faster by identifying the right channel, also the right uh, action. So, you know, it might just be a simple reminder quicker, um, uh, to get that person to pay back because all they needed was a reminder and a model says so. Um, so really we just need to build some models like propensity or build on top of models that you may already have built like propensity to pay back, probability to respond in the channel, and effectiveness of treatment, and get collect uh, more funds faster. Uh, use optimization to actually balance, balance the effectiveness of the treatment 
and the method and the approach to actually uh, collect more overall, so faster, more, but then also be cognizant of costs and balance the cost of the collection effort. Collection efforts can be expensive. Sometimes they involve uh, uh, visits uh, from folks, from agencies, et cetera. And so, you know, ultimately optimization can allow you to collect faster, collect more, and do it inexpensively. Another example is optimization in retail. For this, the competing objective is less customer focused and more product focused. So you're dealing with setting the prices of SKUs on a periodic basis. Uh, you need to understand which products need to be marked down, and this may, may be not just at a SKU level, but also at a store level. So we need to take a careful look uh, at a period, usually one week, of what are our existing inventory levels, what is the model telling us in, in terms of how fast something will sell, and how we can affect that by discounting what is for sale. Um, ultimately, what we can do is automatically use, opt or use optimization to automatically uh, execute on a pricing strategy that ensures that these two objectives are balanced. Those two objectives being primarily maintaining lean inventory levels, uh, but also improving our items to keep a high gross margin. Um, and then there's this consequence of having a good solid optimization process in retail where we avoid having to do these uh, deep, uh, you know, desperate attempts to get rid of inventory rather than having to sell it off. Um, either at a store level or worse, at a national level to make up for certain stores. And then a third exa and final example is optimization and marketing, which is, applies to a lot of different businesses. So we thought we would use this as a, uh, an example to continue on with the demo. Uh, ultimately, marketers are challenged with some pretty basic stuff in terms of aligning offers with customers, but where it gets complicated is the customers themselves. So you may have a list of offers, which are representations of products. We've got some examples on here. But then you'll have a slew of customers. And customers have their preferences. They have their profiles. There's analytics that are in play to predict some of these things. There's customer preferences that allow you to do suppressions. Um, but ultimately, we need to pick a, the right channel to communicate with those customers on, which ones they have a high propensity uh, to respond favorably on, and then pick the right time. So optimization solves a problem, a decisioning problem for marketing, picking the right offer on the right channel to the right customer at the right time. And then, of course, as we said all along, being cognizant with all of the budgets, marketing budgets, contact policy, which is important, making sure suppression lists are adhered to, um, channel propensity, as I mentioned, but also capacity of fulfillment houses. If it's an email server, we need to know how many emails it can send out a day, for example, or a direct mail fulfillment house. We may actually not have a maximum on that, but we may have a minimum based on some contract that we uh, have in play with that direct mail fulfillment house. Ultimately, the value of, um, with a good optimized marketing execution plan is we do respect the policy of that customer and we make best use of that limited interaction. So we're respecting the customer attention. Customer attention is a premium. Uh, today, I'm sure everyone on the line knows that you have less and less time to look at messages and you're inundated with them almost on every channel from you know, your mailbox on your way home from work at night to your email box at the beginning of your day at work in the morning. Um, customer attention is something that we need to treat very limitedly. Uh, channels, uh, and this is something that we're going to go into uh, detail in a demo, but we need to know which is the appropriate channel. So not just suppression lists and not just what customers have told us they prefer, but also conferring with models to find out which is the best channel that a customer is likely to respond favorably on. And then ultimately treatments. And so being able to give marketers that ability to test different messages, different communications to customers, uh, and seeing which ones work best, knowing which ones work best, and allowing the optimization process to align them correctly with the customers. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm actually going to turn this over to Michael Vallele for a demo of marketing channel optimization. Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thanks very much for that, Chris and uh, Joanna. Um, I have a few slides that I'd like to speak about, uh, first of all, in relation to uh, the optimization. So we'll set up just a little scenario uh, that we will go through and um, 
Here it is, really. Uh, for the demonstration, the scenario presented is from a marketing department considering a campaign <coughs> to target its customer base. To conduct the cam campaign, three channels are available to contact customers, email, direct mail, and telephone. Additionally, costs and uh, budgetary uh, constraints for each channel, um, as well as overall budgetary constraints, must be taken into account when conducting the campaign. And as you can see, these are the default constraints that we have, that the um, <coughs> capacity of the internal phone team is limited. Uh, resulting in a cost of 5200 So that's a ceiling cost associated with outbound calls. Um, the agency that we've engaged to send emails charges $0.10 cents per email, and um, each direct mail piece uh, costs $1.50 um, per. Now, in terms of uh, different scenarios, the marketing department needs to assess the most effective contact channel for each customer to maximize profits while operating within the given constraints. So what we're trying to do here is, is optimize and maximize profits. Um, there's also a question of whether profits could be optimized by modifying the constraints and conducting some what-if scenarios. So um, to understand this, what we can see here is this is the default, the thing that um, I suppose um, initiated the need to consider optimization. Given the budget and constraints, which channel is the most effective um, to contact each customer to maximize profits on the campaign? Now, of course, as I said previously, there's also the question of whether uh, what-if scenarios may be incorporated. So what kind of scenarios could we consider here, competing scenarios? Well, first of all, we can see that um, what if we could lower the email costs? So if we could negotiate a lower cost in relation to emails, that scenario is illustrated here. Um, so uh, in terms of the uh, default, you can see that it's 10 cents per email. And uh, if we can negotiate a lower cost, if we can negotiate it uh, at half the price, everything else would remain the same. Uh, an additional um, scenario uh, here is if we can outsource more uh, phone calls. Again, that will lower the cost of um, a phone call. At the moment, it's cost $10 to make a phone call. If we can outsource more, uh, we can half the cost. And of course, the final scenario here is, uh, what if we're just going to increase budget only? Um, and, and looking at something like that, if we're just going to increase budget, everything else remains the same, but we're just going to increase the budget. And we'll see how we can actually implement something like that using uh, Angos. Um, <clears throat> so let's have a look in terms of the general problem setting. The application of optimization requires that the input data is scored for each treatment or output that you're interested in. Uh, model scores are then fed into the optimization tool along with business constraints and, of course, an optimized solution applied. Now, um, the output, uh, it's important to understand um, <clears throat> how this um, is going to be generated um, and, what, and what the output appears as. It's quite straightforward. Uh, the output is generated by um, or by the inside optimizer is a single column. And here it is, exact treatment. You can see here that it will assign whatever treatment or, um, or channel we're associating in this instance uh, to records. Now, of course, you can see that there's some nulls here uh, because not everybody is going to be selected, and that's generally the case. Um, so the only variable that's outputted is exact treatment. Uh, so bear that in mind. So let's have a look at setting this up um, in the Inside Optimizer. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so if you bear with me a second, I think it may take a couple of seconds uh, to uh, um, become evident. Okay, um, you should be able to see my screen now at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm just illustrating at the moment my Knowledge Core Knowledge Studio 9.5 screen. Um, you should be able to see a project. It's called Optimization, as you can see here on the left-hand pane. And I'll just speak through the different components here. 
Now, as we said previously, the Insight Optimizer requires scored data. And here, um, the data being used is a just a, a generic data set. But I've developed three models based on each of the contact channels we have. So you can see here I have a model um, for uh, contacting people by email direct mail and, of course, um, by phone. And so we're assessing what's the likelihood that they will respond if we contact them using any of these methods. Um, just to say that the output for each generates simple probabilities. So we just have scores um, that we're going to feed into the optimizer then. So this is a, an important aspect. We need to have, for example, um, the yes probability. Uh, so how likely somebody is to respond using that specific channel. And so we have this for the three models. We have a scored data set for each of these. Now what I want to do is combine all of these into one file because it makes me uh, the addressing of the issue uh, a lot easier. <clears throat> now what I've done is I've created another workflow here, and I've combined all of the files into uh, multi-response prob. And if I look at this, this contains, and, and I'm just showing uh, a section of the data here, I can see for each customer ID, I have now combined the response probabilities from each of those uh, models for each of the contact channels into one file. Um, and this is the basis from where we can start from. Now, bear in mind, we've also constraints that have to be considered. They don't exist in a file, but we would have them documented somewhere, and then we can input them um, quite straightforwardly. Okay, so once we have um, our data set, it's simply a matter of finding the um, optimization uh, node. Now, you can see we have two optimization nodes here. Uh, one is linear programming, the other is nonlinear programming. Um, in this instance, we're looking at the linear programming, and we're applying it to a marketing uh, problem in terms of contact channel optimization uh, for profit. Um, the nonlinear Optimization can be applied to things like if you're considering a line increase uh, to um, customers and you want to determine what's the level uh, that you should um, assign uh, and try and optimize that, you can use the nonlinear uh, programming. But here I'm using the optimization LP. Now to use it, quite straightforward, just drag it onto the canvas and connect it. Um, when I open it up, I can set all of the options. Now remember about the default scenario we spoke of previously where we had capacities um, for each contact channel. The first thing to do is we have to fill in uh, the values for each of these columns. So first of all, the probabilities. Now I'm going to specify uh, my direct mail probabilities, um, my email probability, and of course uh, my phone uh, probability. Now, once I have those done, you can see the, the costs. The costs that we outlined previously are straightforward. For direct mail, it's going to cost us 150 to contact anyone. For email, well, we uh, know that we have a, a cost of 10 cents. Uh, for contacting somebody using phone, it's going to cost $10. Uh, the revenue, well, the expected revenue from each um, response. Uh, so if somebody responds and they accept our offer, what do we expect to make? And here we're just going to uh, put it as a, a thousand for each. Now in terms of the budget and the volume for each of these, um, again, we did specify options in relation to the um, ceiling um, for uh, email, <coughs> direct mail, and phone calls. So I'm just going to put these in here as values. So I have a budget for um, direct mail of uh, 800 for email of also $800 and for um, the phone I have a budget of 4000 so that's for the individual uh, contact channels and I also have a total budgetary uh, limitation here and that's uh, 5200 now I'm going to assign a treatment for each of these so what's the outcome uh, that I want to assign for each of these so for the direct mail I want it to be of course direct mail and um, for email of course, it's going to be email, and of course, uh, for phone, correspondingly phone. And of course, these um, treatments will exist within my treatment group. So that's the, the setup of the problem. Quite straightforward. Just drag the optimization node onto the canvas, uh, identify the scoring fields, and also input your cost revenue, uh, budget, um, and of course, the output treatment that you want. Now, uh, we have four different scenarios that we spoke about. Um, this is the default. The second one would be negotiating a lower email cost. 
Uh, the third would be negotiating a, a lower phone cost. And the fourth is, of course, nego or just raising the uh, total budget of volume uh, by a thousand. So we'd need another three nodes to be able to specify those scenarios and then compare them. Um, and I've all these pre-created already. So this is the default in terms of the optimization, identical to what we have done here. For lowering email costs, you should see that everything is identical. However, the email cost is, of course, reduced from $0.10 cents to $0.05. Cents. So that's the second scenario that we're going to compare. Outsourcing phone calls, uh, how does this compare? Well, previously, and the default scenario had uh, a value of 10 associated with the cost of contacting somebody using the um, phone. And now we're reducing that to here to 6. So if we can outsource and lower the cost of contacting somebody using the phone to 6, we want to see how that compares. The final um, optimization scenario is, of course, budgets, where we're just <coughs> specifying a constraint as overall budget. Um, a lot of um, <coughs> clients that we do find want to just assess this on the whole rather than have constraints for every individual uh, treatment. So here, to be able to initiate this, um, what I've done is I've set the same budget and volume to each contact method uh, or to each treatment outcome that we're interested in because that's essentially what they are. Um, and what that does is essentially caps the entirety of the project um, at 6,200. And so therefore, it's as if there's no individual budgetary or vo uh, volume limitations here. And of course, the only one that really has any effect or impact is <coughs> the total budget or volume. Now, once we run these, it's quite straightforward. It's just a matter of setting it up and uh, clicking on the Run option. This generates uh, an output file, as you can see here. And because I have four competing scenarios, it is created four competing files. If I just open up these and have a look, uh, I didn't want to link that. I'll just open it up. If I go to my Data tab first, we can see exactly the output that it generates. I've retained the customer ID here, but the only fi a variable that's created in optimization is the exact treatment. Um, and as we can see, um, the optimization is applied to the file on the whole. We wanted to make selections based on our, our inputs and our constraints. So not everybody is going to be included in the output. Um, so you can see that some people have been assigned um, uh, contact treatments, email, phone, direct mail, and of course there are people who haven't been selected or included in any of these, so they've been assigned a null. I should also say that we have an additional report tab for every scenario, and this shows us um, each of the treatments, uh, the overall budget associated with each of these channels, uh, the spend, uh, so what the optimization deemed was appropriate in terms of the amount uh, that we should spend in relation to each of these channels, and the overall profit, not only on the whole, but for each uh, contact method. In this instance, where we're looking at the default, we can see that the greatest profit should be generated uh, by email, uh, followed by direct mail, and finally by phone, giving us the total here of about 1.44 million. Now, what we can do here is split the screen and compare uh, these scenarios side by side or stack them one on top of another. So just to illustrate, what I can do is have a look at each of these scenarios, and I can illustrate all of them uh, simultaneously. So you can see we have the exact same representations for each because they are just um, data files. Um, <clears throat> So in relation to this, um, this is one method to be able to draw the comparisons. Now, for this second scenario here where we're lowering uh, our negotiated lower email cost, we can see here that the total um, uh, returned is actually higher than the default. So here, in comparing these strategies, we can easily see that the lower email cost certainly has um, elicited a higher overall profit return. So this would be... Um, more acceptable or preferable, I suppose, to the default. Now, we can use this method of comparing them, uh, but I want to show you another capability that is incorporated within Angus, and that's to do with integration. We can integrate with other tools. Specifically, um, I'm going to look at integration with Tableau. Um, uh, you may or may not be aware that Tableau is um, a preeminent tool for visualizations. So what I would like to do is, rather than rely on the defaults, which I certainly could do, I just want to show you another way in which you can illustrate and visualize the results to draw comparisons. Um, so if I go to my visualizations, what I want to do is gather all of these results together into the one file. Uh, and so I'm doing that here. And then I'm using a Tableau nodes from my integration palette to create 
uh, a Tableau workbook. I'm applying a Tableau template, and here is the resulting Tableau workbook, which should give us um, all of the results, and we can easily compare between them. So what we should be able to see here is that um, the output is constructed from a number of different uh, tabs that we've created. This dashboard is constructed based on all of these individual tabs. So I've created, for example, a base table um, as well as a, a base um, uh, graphic representation. And what I've done now is included, I've done this for each of the different scenarios. So the base scenario is the default. Email is um, uh, negotiating a lower email cost. Phone is negotiating or outsourcing more phone calls. And budget is just the overall budgetary limitations. So I've done uh, tabs for each of these for uh, tabular and graphic representations, and I've gathered them all together in uh, one um, dashboard, as we can see here, showing me the tabular representations and the graphic. So just to speak about these uh, and be brief, we can see that the default representation or the default optimization scenario returned um, an overall profit of 14 or 1.44 million. We can see the distribution, the counts across each of the selections. So for this specific scenario, uh, we made 8,892 selections and we can see the distribution. Mainly uh, the bulk of those were made up from um, email. Uh, when we look at the lowered email costs, what we can easily see here is, is that um, as a result of lowering the email, we can of course generate more profit um, and what we can see uh, throughout all of these is that the number of selections for email is greater um, for the scenario where we lowered email costs in comparison to others. Um, now we can see throughout that we can just focus on the grand total to determine which gives us the greatest return and as we can see it's the fourth scenario here which just focuses on um, a constraint of overall budget. You can see that the profit that it's generated is 2.33 million. Uh, that's quite in excess of the next nearest uh, which is here uh, of 1.678 million. Also notice that the constraint of just uh, overall budget um, excluded or did not include anybody to be contacted by phone. It's just focusing on direct mail and, of course, um, email. But we can see, again, the graphic representations, again, giving us the distributions and, and expected profit um, from each of the individual um, contact channels for each scenario. But again, just to point out that uh, we've done comparisons here between four different scenarios, and the one that gave us the greatest return is, of course, uh, budget. And that's the one that we could easily then uh, create a file based on uh, and export in whatever way uh, we deemed necessary. So depending on the type of export you want, you could easily specify that and export it accordingly to the appropriate uh, department. Okay, um, so that's really a, a simple demonstration of our optimization capabilities uh, in terms of uh, applying it to a, a marketing optimization uh, representation. So I'm just going to get back here to the initial presentation. Uh, and what I want to do here is speak about... Um, okay, so I think this is buffering and going on to the next slide. So what we had seen here really is um, an aspect of, of the platform that we provide. Um, so we've looked today at the Insight Optimizer, and this is an element within uh, the entire platform array that Angos do provide. Uh, so bear that in mind. This is specifically the Insight Optimizer from within um, uh, the Angos Analytics platform. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm just going to hand it back uh, to Joanna very quickly. Thank you, for, uh, thank you, Michael, for the demonstration of Inside Optimizer. So we, before we go to questions, um, I'd like to summarize some of the topics we've covered today by leaving you with a few facts and trends that are being observed by organizations and analysts in the prescriptive analytics landscape. Uh, first of all, prescriptive analytics works great on big data. It turns your data into powerful actions by making your predictive models actionable and improves your confidence in business outcomes. Um, and so it has the capability to really turn that mountain of a problem that you may have into a speed bump. Um, also, what's interesting to notice is that prescriptive analytics continues to climb on the Gartner hype scale. This trend is further confirmed with a recent survey by the 2015 Chief Analytics Officer Forum, which states that 56.3 um, Chief Analytics Officers plan to invest in business optimization and analytics applications in the next 12 to 24 months. So we're really seeing that importance climb. And of course, Gartner 
Gartner um, is forecasting that with the increasing importance of prescriptive analytics and optimization, by 2018, optimization will no longer be a niche discipline. So it will really become a best practice for leading organizations uh, to address a wide range of complex business decisions. And you're probably wondering also, so how do we really get started with Angos? Well, to enhance your interaction with us, we offer both software and services. Um, early in the presentation, Michael illustrated our data science platform uh, just a few slides ago, which showcased Angos's comprehensive software suite, um, anywhere from data preparation to model building, um, all the way to visualization with our native charts and through our partnerships with Tableau and Click, and um, model as well as model management functionality. Um, also, I would like to point out that Angos' software is known for our easy-to-use graphical user interface and workflow, which makes soft the software accessible to both advanced users um, and business um, users as well. Um, but also, if you're saying to yourself, this is great, but, we're, um, but we just don't have the in-house knowledge or resources, uh, we have you covered there too with our professional services team, uh, which includes training, consulting, and fully hosted um, and managed solutions. We can have you up and running regardless of whether you do or don't have the required resources. And so we really want to make your experience with us as easy as possible. Um, with that said, before we go to questions, I wanted to let you know if we don't get to all the questions, I will be compiling them and I will be sending them out within the next um, couple of days. So, and additionally to that, um, to enhance and optimize your view today, uh, we've included a resource list um, on your viewing window that has the Insight Optimizer brochure as well as um, our web page for you to uh, scroll through. So um, I'm just, I see here that we're really running right of, um, short on time, so I'm going to go to the first questions. Um, the first question here is for Michael. Do results have to be scored with a model developed with Angos? Um, thanks for that, Joanna. Um, actually, no, they don't. Uh, the input can be a data file um, that's generated with any tool, uh, but as long as there's propensity scores on that data file, they can be used, but they don't have to be developed with Angos. It's good if they are, but if you have developed uh, models and scored data with other tools, uh, you can still optimize that data in Angos just as long as that propensity score exists. Okay, thank you, Michael. We'll do maybe two more questions. In what other scenarios can this be applied? Um, so uh, this can be uh, applied as we had seen um, uh, for marketing. If you have any set of um, channels that you're trying to optimize, I suppose, trying to get the right product to the right person at the right time. Um, so in relation to areas which it can be applied, um, it can be applied and evaluators, or, or sorry, I should say, it can be applied in um, uh, price optimization, product preference, credit line increases, marketing optimization, as we had seen um, here. So really, the, the, the uh, uh, applicability is quite expansive, and we can work with you if it's a case you, you're not sure as to um, the relevance, uh, but you, you do think that you're not um, making enough out of the selections that you are currently um, generating. Uh, there is the potential that optimization can also be applied. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, our last question, I'll, t I'll actually ask Chris here. How do I prove value for optimization? And the next part of that is, is it possible to test optimization for value today without upsetting our current processes? Yeah, sure. So one of the major challenges um, uh, of adopting any new software venture or in any new work is proving value. And optimization actually comes uh, you know, as part and parcel of an op uh, any optimization project is proof of its value. As I mentioned earlier, you're actually optimizing based on some goal, uh, and then you can materialize a list, which is not you know, necessarily put into execution, but it's something that can be scrutinized. And so what I typically recommend is take a section of your data that you've been tracking in the past, stuff that you've actually gone to market with, and then run everything else being equal, the types of constraints that you ran into, the types of actions that were performed and the customers, run an optimization process on that and compare. And so you have a real world comparison of what you did do, the value that you gained, and what optimization could have done. It leads to a very powerful report and can help you, you know, generate a business case to take this to the next level. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'm actually seeing that we still have quite a bit of attendees, so I will go to one more question. Uh, Michael, this will be for you. How do I get the output to integrate with my current execution systems? Um, that's that's quite a, a broad question. Um, we would really have to engage with you and uh, determine uh, what execution systems you're actually using and what file formats you would require as input for those. So um, the output, the inside optimizer, is really just a column, and everybody's been assigned an appropriate treatment. Um, those results can be delivered to any system uh, in whatever format is required. So what I'm trying to say is that Angos can really output um, in an appropriate format uh, for your system to deal with. It's just a matter of us knowing what that system is, and that would require uh, just, um, I, I'm sure, uh, a very, very short conversation. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. We're definitely out of time here today, um, so I'd like to thank everybody uh, for your time. Uh, if we didn't once again get to your questions, I will be compiling them, we will answer them, and we will be sending those out in the next couple of days. Um, so once again, thank you again for, particip for your participation in today's Optimize It webinar, and enjoy the upcoming holidays, and thank you, Chris and Michael.